So Act 4. Act 4 is the most difficult act in the game, so if you're looking for how to beat it, you've come to the right place. The first thing you want to do once you get into Rhodes, by the way, Rip Colossus, is you're going to want to take inventory of your resists. Now, if you've been following my videos so far, you're probably squared away on Vitality, on Poison, and the Elements. But in addition to those things, you're going to want to make extra consideration towards physical, and you're definitely going to want pierce res. The arcane arts are no more than remembering secrets that you once knew. So if you're low on anything, it's probably pierce. Physical is really hard to get no matter what. So if you want more pierce, just look for the rigid and the tempered prefixes, particularly on your chest piece. Uh, maybe even on your boots if you're willing to sacrifice uh some other resists like elemental usually i like elemental on my boots and honor my son word is that a great and in that chest piece you can either put a, a hag skin from the hag snack two or a boar's hide from the boars in act one either way you're going to want to roll a completion bonus of pierce res and it won't be very significant so you're going to need a little bit more pierce res than that in terms of the elemental damages, the only thing you need to worry about is lightning for two fights and for cold for maybe one fight. I mean, the Boatmaster is the only cold damage fight in the game that's worth trying to mitigate, but on normal you can get away with not having any. So by the way, after you leave the first town, you want to make your way immediately north into this cave, the Cave of Orthia. And this is where you resolve the giant enemy crab quest. He's here on the coast, and he's actually pretty dangerous. Like I said last video, all the little annoying creatures become devastating killers. These tiny little shore crabs, these things are going to gobble you up quick. So you don't want to engage this giant crab with the other little crabs near you. If that happens, just wait for him to go underground and then kite and pick off the little crabs. Let him come to you. Anyway, this act is all about pacing and being careful. It's about knowing when to fight and when to skip mobs and run away. A lot of it comes down to feeling, but there's no real way to counter this act with gear alone. And that makes it unique, and it's what makes this act so challenging. By the way, where I'm standing right now is the secret passage. I'm not going to go into the secret passage this video. All you need to know is the key to enter it drops from Hades, and the most important monster in there is Toxius. There are plenty of videos going over that. You want to find this guy on the shore. This is a quest you didn't get in town. It's actually a pretty difficult quest, not on normal, but on epic and legendary. It's, it's a pretty high damage check. They want you to escort this poor little boy up to this uh, lighthouse. I'm not sure why they all couldn't just escort him. I mean, they're just chilling on the beach. But apparently it's just his job. What you want to do is kind of put yourself on the stairs, because they will beeline it for him. They, they really hate this guy. They'll completely skip you like you're not even there and just walk straight up to him. That's why it's a damage check. But every now and then they'll switch to you and they'll kill you quick. So it's a bit of a dangerous uh, mission. You might have to try it a few times. That boy dies a lot. And it's a bit of an annoying one, but you can always come back to it. The beacon. You can see it gives you a formula. So if you're like me and you don't even have a relic by now, a chance uh, by getting a formula to get a good relic, it, you know, it's not something you want to skip. Although I will say with Act 5, they give you a relic for free, a completed relic. So don't sweat it too much if you don't have a relic by now. My sergeant. We're doing this kind of quick fire, but there's another quest here you don't want to skip. Again, you didn't get it in town. But basically that little camp to the left once you get to this forest is being overrun. And they want you to kill this big dude, I don't know what his name is, but he's northeast of the town. You'll know you're going the right way if you run into these Hydrodons. And you'll see a cave on your mini-map. He's at the end of the cave. Now one of the first things you'll probably notice about the enemies in this act is they're all demons. Well, most of them are demons. 
We'll talk about the significance of that in a bit. But the other thing you'll notice is you're probably getting crit, whereas before you weren't getting crit, and you're getting crit often. There's a real spike in the offensive ability that enemies have in this act. Uh, I would guess it's somewhere around 250 to 350. So if you're getting crit, you definitely need more defensive ability. You shouldn't be that far short by now. You should have maybe 200. So maybe it will be enough to swap some of the health on your swap rings to defensive ability instead. If you're low on defensive ability and health, you're going to want maybe 2,000 by this point. Then I recommend grinding. Just grind until you can find some DA gear. Go to the database and look for some charms you can grind to help you out with health and DA. It's worth sacrificing a little bit on your resists and a little bit on your health just to make sure you're not getting crit. So this mini boss is pretty dangerous. What you want to do is bait out his ground slam. He always does it in pairs. So if you get hit by the first one, you will get hit by the second one. And his follow up attack will kill you if that didn't kill you straight away. But it's a cadence based attack. That means you could bait out the first one. And a few seconds later, he'll cast it again, maybe 10 seconds later. It depends on what speed you're playing on. But this entire cave is dangerous, and that's totally redundant to say, because this entire act is dangerous. So just treat everything like a dragon kin from Act 3. The Unfortunately, you have to turn that quest in in person. It doesn't auto-resolve. So that's kind of annoying, because you have to go all the way down there and all the way back up again. Anyway, I mentioned demons. So I said you can't really outgear this act. That's not technically true. There's one item in the game called Shadow Wall, and it's. I mean, I want to mention it just because it's so strong, but it's so strong that it's unethical. Like, it completely counters this entire act. This entire act is mostly demons, that's what makes it dangerous. And Shadow Wall is a shield that gives you 60% less damage from demons. So all the damage they're dealing to you. It's just multiplied by 0.4, right at the top of the damage order. So that's really powerful. It's extremely powerful. It's unfair, to be honest. But it's also unlikely you'll have one. It's level 33, and it's pretty rare. You want to grab all these quests? It's not easy here. Try trading goods with all these women who can turn you into a mouse. Right. There's a bunch of them, uh, and this area, this entire area, the, the woods and the ruins, it can either take you two hours or it can take you 20 minutes. I'm going to show you the way to make it 20 minutes. So the very first thing you want to do is you have to get through this this cave of Formicids. Now I've read on the for the forums a lot of people have problems with the Formicids, particularly the captains, but they're just like any other creature that has onslaught. You want to make sure that you don't let them wail on you too long, and you do that just by disengaging and re-engaging. That's all you have to do. It's not even really about patience, it's just about tactical retreat, stutter step, whatever. But for some reason, I really like killing Formicids. They're probably my favorite thing to kill in this entire game. I don't know why, they just give me a satisfaction when they die. Maybe it's because I don't like bugs in real life, but they're fun to kill. Anyway, if you don't have a Shadow Wall, and you probably don't, then the next best thing is to be a shield wielder. So that's someone that either scales strength enough to use shields or has rune word feather to lower the requirements or the equivalent defense mastery version. Reason for that is you can get a yellow or a green shield and you can put a spiny shell in it, which is a charm that you get from the crabs found on the coast at the beginning. Uh, and that'll give you damage, flat damage. So if you're using your shield offensively, I would recommend the, the spiny shell. And also I'd recommend that you roll it with a pierce resistance completion bonus. 
If you're not using your shield defensively, then you'll get a little bit more mileage out of a rigid carapace, which is a pierce resist charm that drops an act two off the scarabs, and you can also roll a pierce completion bonus. So if no shadow wall, that's your second best bet. Now it's likely you don't use a shield at all, in which case, well, you're going to have to play it like me. I mean, technically I'm using a shield right now, but I get rid of it pretty quick, and it's not anything that's mitigating what I want it to mitigate. The pierce damage happens mostly at the end of act. I mean, with the notorious Grandmaster archers, trust me, you'll, you'll get to know them. So having this shield like I do right now isn't really giving me much. These Lamias also have an extremely high offensive ability, so they'll probably crit you too. Really, if you're getting crit at the beginning of the act, you're going to have a really bad time here. So you're going to want to fix that. Anyway, we got a bunch of quests in Medea's Grove. The very first thing you want to do in this swamp is to find this plant thing, Night Blossom. Now he's extremely dangerous, all of those projectiles shotgun. So if you're playing a melee character, you, I mean, you have to be very careful. It might even be worth it just to buy a bow and whittle him down. It'll take like two minutes, but it's worth it not to die. After you pick up his unique item, the other two unique items for the potion are due east and due west. So once you start going east like I have, and you can go west if you want, you'll see the exclamation point, the quest item, on your mini-map. And if you can help it, you want to approach this camp from the north. It kind of winds down south, but then you have to kill a lot of frogmen. And I'll probably say it multiple times, but I don't think 90% of the creatures in Act 5 are worth fighting at all. This act, to me, is a run-through. It's all about how much skipping can you get away with, and how much little opportunities can you get to get experience and gear along the way. So I've yet to collect the western ingredients, that's what I'm going to do right now. You can see it again on my mini-map. And by the way, you can grind these guys for monster and frequence. You can grind a lot of things for monster and frequence. There's a lot of good gear, yeah that can drop in Act 4, but I don't think any of it's worth it. Especially now that Ragnarok is out, there's so much good loot, so many great monster and frequent, so many great farming spots. And trust me, stick around. Next episode, we'll go over most of the ones I know that are really worthwhile. So you're going to get a lot of good ideas for catch-up mechanisms in Act 5. So go ahead and skip Act 4 to your heart's content. After you've got those three potion ingredients, go north, and you're going to see a cave. It's the Tomb of the Tusconian Queen. Now there's two tombs like this. You have to get a key from each one. In this cave, the only thing you have to worry about is the queen herself. She drops a key. There's nothing else in here that's valuable. And you're going to use this key later on to resolve one of the quests, along with the other key that drops. There is, I think, a lower level to this tomb, and you'll encounter your first tortured souls. They, they kind of remind me of those jellyfish from Mass Effect. What are they called? The Hanar. If you kill them, you actually get a really nice charm called Tortured Soul. It, uh something I think you put on jewelry, so jewelry is a contended slot, but if you're lucky, you'll get a completion bonus that reduces damage taken from demons. So it's really the next best thing to Shadow Wall, but again, between Dionysus Wineskin, which is very, very good in this act, and Demon's Blood, which is critical in this act, it's really hard to justify. I would say on higher difficulties, Epic and Legendary, the Tortured Soul might actually beat out the Wineskin. It's worth it to grind for sure. Anything to make your life easier in Act 4 is going to be enormously useful to you. And I'm just sharing all the things that I've found, all the things that I do. Honestly, for the most part, 
I've done this act enough times to where I just know how to take it carefully. So I don't need to go out of my way to gear for it. But if this is your first playthrough, or you're a returning player, then, you know, just follow the things that I've said. Get those charms, go grind them. They really don't take that much time. Spiny Shell and Rigid Carapace. You can, if you're dual wielding, you can sacrifice a little bit of damage to wield a shield this act. This act is not about how much damage you deal. It's about how much damage you mitigate and how much damage you dodge. So in this second tomb, which is also north once you enter the ruins for the first time, uh, in addition to the undead boss, there's also this little girl. Now she's the sister to some guy, okay? So after you find some girl, you're going to find some guy later. I'm just saying that in the same tomb that you get the second part of the key, make sure you search for this girl. She's in the south part of the tomb. All you have to do is rescue her, and you need to do that in order to resolve the brother-sister quest. We'll run into the brother later. But there's this whole checklist of things you need to do to make this portion of the act efficient. And it's pretty important that you follow all the steps. You can really, really optimize Act 4, and you can really optimize Act 5, too. The difference in time is phenomenal. So only after you have both parts of the key, all three ingredients to the potion, and after you found the sister, are you ready to move deeper into the ruins, deeper meaning more northeast. And the next thing you'll do is to fight the Lich Queen. Now, she's not going to give you any trouble. Why? Because if you've been following these videos, then you have maximum vitality res. And that's exactly what you need for her. Having max vitality res means that you can trade with her up until she casts her meteors, and that's the only thing you need to dodge. Otherwise, you're going to have to dodge everything, and you're going to be chugging potions, and you'll have a horrible time. So I got unlucky and I ran into this giant frogman. I mean, he's insane. Look how much damage he's doing. I decided not to be cowardly and I, I killed him. But stuff like that, I mean, I have no idea what some of these hero monsters do. You can play this game for hours, many hundreds of hours, and still not encounter all the heroes. And there's some new heroes with Anniversary. There's some new heroes they add in patches and with Ragnarok. I've even heard that you can run into Toxius the Murderer as a random hero spawn. That would be terrifying. He's, like I mentioned before, in the Secret Passage. So there's the brother. He's in the very northern part of the ruins right after you pass the, the Lich Queen. So now you've done the Lich Queen, you've found the brother, you're going to go through this intermediate area through the swamp, and you're going to end up in another ruin. So remember this intermediate area. It's one of those landmarks that I remember because right when you get into the new ruin you want to go south and there's going to be a tomb here the great tomb of Doris and this is where you turn in your keys I don't bother with the undead here the undead are actually very strong there's these blight collars that do enormous poison damage which is why you want max poison res so I just hit these levers and I complete the quest So you're going to see me skipping around like this a lot. I mean, the Tower of Judgment, I pretty much skip 80% of it, as you'll see. And that can lead to lower experience. So I'm not even level 30 yet, so I'm, I'm really in trouble. But I'm not actually worried about it. As long as I can get through this act, which I'm confident I can do, then Act 5 is really going to save the day. I love Act 5. I was kind of sketchy about it at first, just because it was so long. But after I optimize the route, and I still have a lot of optimizing to do, but I was very happy with the run that uh, this character did, which you'll see next video. But there's just so many opportunities for loot and experience, 
Uh, and it's actually a lot of fun. Especially now that they've ironed out some of the bugs and the craziness. Anyway, once you've turned in those, uh, the key, then you're actually ready to fight the boss here. There's, there's nothing else to do. So if you've been watching, follow the route that you saw me take. If you've been listening, go back and check that checklist that I said audibly before. Make sure you've done everything. Because there's actually a lot to do here, and it's easy to forget something. If you're really desperate to grind experience here, like you're way behind and you know it, there's a couple places. I guess I'll talk to, about it after this boss. So this boss, uh, it looks like they're doing vitality and nothing but vitality, but they're actually doing majority electricity. They're also doing vitality. So as long as you have shored up on your vitality res and also your uh, lightning res, which you saw me check before the fight, then you'll be fine. The overall strategy to the fight is they trade around this eye, and the eye gives them a defense and offense buff, so it makes them, you know, just them, but tougher. So what I like to do is kind of spread around the damage. That'll make sure that whoever has the eye when the other two are dead is already on low life, like you saw here. The other strategy is just to tunnel vision one of them down, just to lower the damage throughout, but... I find that it's burst damage that kills me, and I don't want to be bursted by some super-powered sister. So once you kill them, and they're pretty easy to be honest, go ahead and turn in all these quests. And you're gonna have to go back to Rhodes as well, and turn in those quests. But anyway, like I was saying before, if you're really desperate for experience, like I said, I like killing Formicids, I don't know why. Uh, so I would hit up maybe Elysium, which we'll encounter later, or maybe before the City of Lost Souls. That's another place we'll encounter later. Also, I think for most characters, unless you're somebody who doesn't fight undead very well, the first domain of the Tower of Judgment, the one with the Lemos, is very, very good for experience. So there we go. We finished Medea's Grove. We are, what, uh, 20 minutes into the video? Now, of course, I'm playing with the game sped up. But on very fast, that whole segment usually takes me about 20 minutes. Now, Epirus is the next area. This is another area you can optimize a bit. Just grab all these quests. I hadn't pass it on. Gone. And this, this is all I have left. You're going to be chugging potions a lot, so keep a good stock, 80 plus at all times. And keep a good lookout for better swap rings, like I said, if you're short on DA, defensive ability, you're getting crit a lot, then maybe switch out some of your swap rings with health your patronage into swap honor. rings with DA. Or look for better versions of them. Maybe an annulling amulet with a secondary affix, stuff like that. Don't neglect the vendors. These straight right when you get into this foggy area, there's actually another quest giver. He's easy to miss. Uh, if you're like me, I can't see anything in this fog. The, the particle density is pretty absurd. I don't know if it's because of my graphic settings or... Maybe my resolution, I don't really know. But I can barely see anything in here. The only reason I'm killing these guys is because I can see their little aura. And by the way, I don't recommend grinding money here. You can, but the vendor's kind of far from where these guys are. You should really grind for your money in Act 3. So there's, there's about five of these locations with these Karas in them. And you'll get that familiar quest complete sound when you've found them all, but the quest is not complete yet. Before you turn it in, actually I turn it in right away. Okay, yeah, so right when you hear that sound, go ahead and turn it in. You turn it in at this hidden guy, Thank you for the guy that you saw right when the smoke started appearing. And then you're ready to continue on.
don't worry about the first two quests you got, except for this one. Go up this alley to the northwest. I thought I could do it. Here's Admetus. So Admetus is going to make an appearance several times. I think he's related to Phaon because he fails at things he does too. You want to get his medicine package, which was one of the quests that you got uh, at the start in Epirus. The other one was to kill the general here. Good news, you can go right to her. I can't see crap, so that's exactly what I'm going to do. And there she is. So get used to that mana burn. You're going to see it a lot. It's very potent, and it sucks, but it's on a very long cooldown. That's the way you counter it, to be honest. This is one of my favorite moments in the entire game, the Passage of Souls. I love the aesthetic of this. I love the verticality of it. The idea that you're following all these dead souls. And this transition, oh, so good. As far as tile set transitions go, that's probably my favorite in the whole game. I mean, you start out in this sort of Greek-ish area and end up in this dystopian, horrible... Hades place. It almost looks like it's underwater. There's one other area that kind of blows me away with this act later on. I'll definitely point it out. I mean, you can't stop me. I love that area. But this is the River Styx. So there's a couple of quests you have to do here. Can you... And also the second proper boss know... in this act. I have seen now I'm going to go to Epirus first and turn in those two quests. Uh, the vendor probably has reset, so I recommend checking the vendor again. I won't... Vendor resets are very, very the common. Moves. They're frequent. I lost the rest. So you want to check on them often, especially in Act 4. You want every edge you can get. Your patronage is an honor. So you'll see this sort of ziggurat, it's called the Shrine of the Golden Bow. There's nothing before the ziggurat, just remember that. You have to go on the other side of the ziggurat, which you have to cross this thing by the way, you can't avoid it. And this is where you find the one who will lead. So once you pass the ziggurat, go south where the Formicids are, rejoice in killing them, they're a lot of fun. The captains are also pretty easy to see, so that's unlike the Ichthians from last act, where, I mean, you'd never know there was something we so deadly right next one. to you. So here he is, he's in this prison. Once you approach the prison, you gotta kill the troglodyte. Troglodytes are also pretty fun to kill. They have a bit too much HP, though, I think. And after you find that guy, you're actually ready to fight Kron. He's the boatmaster. I guess it's the guy that you'd put the two coins on your eye for the boatman. You know how you see that in movies and stuff. In this case, we're just going to kill him. So technically, he does a lot of cold and vitality damage. On higher difficulties, I would mitigate the cold. On normal mode, not necessary. As long as you don't stand on these very obvious geyser things, which come out of the gratings, then you're going to be fine. There's also these, uh, you can see projectiles coming from the water. That's cold and vitality. In this second form, he summons some ghosts. They have, uh, what is it? Death chill aura. So you're going to want to kill them quickly. They're going to drain your health. And you can see a lot of what I'm doing is just dodging where I can, not standing on the gratings. I choose not to ever dodge that wave AoE. It's just, it's one of those things you ignore. And he goes down without an issue. He's harder on Epic and Legendary than he is on this difficulty. And you compensate for that by just getting a little bit more cold res. 
maybe feel out the fight a little bit at the start before you commit to getting him into second transition. Just so you know what kind of damage you're in for. Once you're in this marsh, just know that there's nothing you need to explore. No caves, nothing like that. The very next thing you need to do is to kill the... What is he called? The Stygian Lurker? He's basically a boss, a mini-boss Hydradon. This is also a pretty decent place to farm spiny shells. There's a lot of crabs around here. Unfortunately, they're kind of mixed in with these toad men, and they're not fun to farm. That said, you can find a nice resurrection shrine and do a reverse grind somewhere. That is if you're a conqueror or something and you really want uh, the extra damage and mitigation. And I really recommend that. I think it's 20 damage physical for the completed relic on normal mode, or the completed charm. That's actually a lot. That's pretty significant. So if you're using those shield proc skills from Defense Mastery, that'll add a lot of damage, especially combined with something like a Sabertooth, where you're attacking fast and therefore you have a better chance and at proccing and a higher proc per minute. You can see I overshot it. Once you get to the end where there's that ornate looking dungeon door, then you've overshot the Stygian Lurker, so you have to go back. Here he is. If I was looking at my mini-map, I would have saw him here. Clear the crabs first. Again, they mean business. And this guy hits hard too, so you don't want to get caught and die embarrassingly to crabs. I'm going to assume that no one here has ever died to crabs, because if you did, you wouldn't tell anyone. But you can see that that's a quest you really don't want to skip. It gives nice stats for strength, dex, and intellect. So real quick, while I'm fast-forwarding through this uninteresting part, there's a couple of resources I wanted to go over, and I've mentioned a few of them, but if you're a newer returning player, they're going to help a lot. These are resources that people put a lot of time and effort into, and they've been around forever, some of them. First one is TQ Database. There's a website for it. And it's a database of all the items. It's updated for Ragnarok, by the way. Not all of the drop rates and who drops what is totally updated. There's a lot that's still being tested for Ragnarok. But you'll find all the items there, and you'll get a good idea of what monster and frequency you want to grind, etc. There's a calculator that was updated for Ragnarok. It's just Google TQ Calculator. I think it was updated by... Kermizi Perfect, which is another resource. By the way, here's an ornate door right before the City of Lost Souls. You don't have to go in there to get the quest. There is a quest in there. You have to go throughout all of Act 4 before you can resolve it. So because you don't need to get the quest to resolve it, I would just not even go in there until you have all four of the stones. Be thought. Some of us so just grab all these quests. Lore, lore, lore. Not sure what any of this is. Just grab them all. We tried to... Immortal. I can smell your blood. Again, stock up on potions. Life. Yes. So, Kermizi Perfect is a forum slash guide repository, written guide. Uh, a lot of the guides you have to take with a grain of salt. Ragnarok and Anniversary shook things up. Now, there was a lot of Anniversary Edition guides and updates on Kermizi, but Ragnarok especially hasn't received... Uh, I mean, people are still testing. It's early days for the people who are really into it. So that stuff will come. In the meantime, the core of all those guides is, is still true. The numbers might be a little bit off. Some of the mechanical ideas are way off, but, you know, that's what updated guides are for. And now a mortal, is that it? First is Dame right. In the meantime, it'll put you on the right track. So if you play Grim Dawn, there's a TQ Vault, just like there's a Grim Vault. It's exactly like Grim Vault. You can find that online. There's TQ Defiler, which is a character editor. I can smell your blood. I remember life. Yes, life. And now a mortal. Right. These guys are all creepy, so I'm vendor farming if you can't tell. 
So I don't I don't recommend cheating with the character editor. It's just that there's so few tools. I can smell your blood. Okay, this guy is gonna smell my blood again. Yes. There's so few tools for testing in this game that a character editor is a really good bet. Most of the modules haven't been updated for Titan Quest, but the bare minimum modules, the ones that come with the initial download, those work for the most part. Goodbye. Living Simple traveling. stat changes, waypoints, stuff like that. That stuff will help you out with testing. If you're savvy and you know Ooh, the mechanics well know. enough, you'll be able to create test cases and test benches for most of the things you want to Long test using a character editor. Also, these uh, Furies, they dropped that thing, which is Furies Heartblood, a charm unique to these dudes. It's really good. As you can see, the amount of vitality damage is absurd for a charm. It's something you put in your weapon. I've always wanted to make a build that relies around that charm, but there's never quite been the itemization. Like, there's no monster infrequent vitality stabs, for instance. Maybe with the new Demonic Rippers, I can make something happen with Spirit and Dream Masteries. I don't know. So right when you get into this Fury area, you want to hang a left and you want to destroy these carts. You saw me do it cautiously there. Once you destroy the first one, four wardens spawn and charge you immediately. So I like to approach from the south, destroy the first cart, back off, and try to body pull two of those wardens at a time. It's just something I learned from dying a long time ago. That's the last thing you need to do in this part of the marsh, so you can move on and stick to the west from here. If you want to, to know more about mechanics and you're not satisfied with uh, this video or any written guides on Kermese alone, you can take this info, uh, or any old info really, there's a ton of it out there, and vet it against the Anniversary Edition change log. Which again, just type Anniversary Change Log in Google. It's a big document with a ton of documented changes from Anniversary Edition, and there were a ton. Uh, and then from there, vetted against the recent Ragnarok expansion, they have some dev uh, change logs, patch notes. And there have been a few patches since the recording of this video too, so look for those as well on the Steam homepage, or on the Steam forums, or just Google them yourself. If you're looking for forums and community, and by the way, this is the first stone carrier. You don't want to miss her. She has the frost stone. Once you kill her, just go northeast. The next thing you want to do is to find Admetus. He's that failure who died delivering the medicine. He's in one of these cages. You'll know you're in the right place because it's a giant set of cages. And there's a lot of these troglodytes around. Just click on all the cages. He's in the back. And there's this troglodyte hero as well. So anyway, for community, the forums are kind of scattered, uh, but you'll have some luck on the Steam forums, uh, the goodoldgames.com forums, which is another place you can buy this game. Uh, the subreddit has some active people, and Kermizy Perfect also does forums where people put build guides and stuff like that, written build guides. And if you find this game too easy, there's XMAX. It's a mod you can download on the Steam Workshop or elsewhere on the internet. And it just multiplies all the mob spawns and bosses by three. It's very popular. Anyway, you saw I entered this cave. Not the other cave to the west, but this cave. You know you're at this cave when you've reached troglodytes. Troglodytes are guarding it outside. It's not demons or anything like that, like the Karis or the McKay or whatever. And in here is one of the hardest bosses in the whole act. You're going to want to clear once you reach these albino spiders. You're going to want to clear all of them. Don't leave any of them because you don't know how much kiting you're going to have to do for this boss. And this boss is why we got so much lightning res. I don't have max lightning res. I'm probably going to be fixing that before I engage her. But she, you wouldn't know it by looking at these spiders. I mean, they're spiders, but they deal a lot of lightning damage. 
what the boss does is in addition to dealing a ton of damage herself she also spawns five or six little adds and they'll zap you to death very quickly so what you need to do is you need to kill all but one of them if you can help it all while dodging her nets so you don't get gibbed and kiting her all at the same time so you can see it's going to be pretty dicey for me I'm trying to take an opportunity to kill her babies, but not all of them, or else she'll summon more. If you leave one or two alive, she won't resummon. And then to kite her away from her young, just in case I get webbed. Uh, it's not her attacking me with two adds. And you can clearly see, even by dodging her summon mechanic, She's still giving me a huge amount of trouble with max lightning res or close to it. But you need to kill her, it's for a quest. And in my opinion, she's the hardest boss in this act. So if she gives you trouble, don't sweat it. She's killed me plenty of times. This time I was prepared, although she still could have killed me if I would have missed one or two more of those trap projectiles. So at this time you've got the frost relic, you found the caravan, the destroyed caravan, you got the mirror, and you freed Admetus from prison. So from here you just want to continue on into the Veil of Mourning. So there's these giant sort of creatures, you can kill them, I'm not even going to try to pronounce what they're called. Unfortunately the large monsters in this game don't really give the experience that they should. These guys are kind of an exception. But I mean, they're hard to kill. This character I'm using is very powerful. Just happened to be that way. And once you get to Erebus, this is where things get really hard. This is where you're going to start encountering Grandmaster Archers. They're a form of McKay Archer. They're nothing special. They're not a hero or anything like that. They're just a yellow version of a McKay Archer. And you'll be able to identify them because they always have this poison enchantment. Here's one right now. And you can see how much delicate kiting and sidestepping I need to do just to stay alive. But they're extremely powerful. They're the reason for everyone's nightmares. It, I mean, you can fight two or three at once. I mean, imagine that dance if I had two more of them fighting me. It just, it gets ridiculous. So that's why there's so much that goes into Act 4 that, I mean, it's not about gear countering, it's just about, okay, I'm gonna die in two hits, so how do I deal with these guys? And the way you deal with those is by utilizing their kind of bizarre AI. So you can see if you're watching these archers close enough that they have a sort of logic, like an AI. They're trying to, I don't know, it's like some sort of archer duel, right? They're sidestepping even when you're not shooting at them. They're just kind of chaotically moving around. Now you can capitalize on that. If you can get them to move around and to stop, or you're close enough to hit them but then they start moving around again, then you can engage them before they engage you. That's the whole trick to beating a McKay uh, Grandmaster Archer, is to not engage them if they're already shooting you. If you've already taken one or two hits, it's too late to engage them. You gotta break away in potion. So you really need to make sure you're the one getting the first shot. Don't worry if you're melee, there's always a pillar to kite and LOS. No big deal. But it's the same idea if you're melee. You want to make sure that you're the one getting the first hit. So don't forget this necromancer quest. It's here next to the Grandmaster McKay archers. If you've reached the second sort of mud geyser area, you've gone too far. It's kind of easy to miss, I suppose, but you'll see the dungeon on the mini-map once you're in this area. There's also combinations of, of demons that are extremely deadly here. I mean, these, whatever, ringed impusas, is that what they're called? The blue ones, they, uh, they freeze you. <laughs> and the problem with that is if you engage one of those with a Grandmaster Archer, and you get frozen, I mean, you're super dead. Just like that frog, I, I ran into this guy. I mean, I was immediately intimidated because I don't know what the heck that thing is. He's just, like, destroying the planet with that 
stomp, but fortunately for me, he just kind of died, so disaster averted, I guess. But once you reach the far plains, you're going to want to stick to the west-ish. I mean, you're going to want to go slightly west of north. You're going to immediately see another cave on your mini-map. That's where you resolve the Dust of the Titans side quest. Not a side quest you want to skip. Again, as is tradition, it's guarded by troglodytes on the outside. That's how you know it's a, a good cave and not a false flag. The boss in here is, is nothing like the albino spider. He's just a giant one of those unpronounceable gargantuans. He does a lot of damage, but you just treat him like a boar from Act 1. If you saw that video or if you've been watching me play since then, You'll know I use this sort of technique that's kind of like stutter stepping, but really it's more watching their attack animation and moving away before they connect. This guy, you have the added task of baiting out his AoE. It's a pretty short range AoE. So all it means is you don't want to be in melee range when you think it's off cooldown. He can't just spam it. That means you want to bait it out and then trade with him and then bait it out and then trade with him. That'll allow you to kill him with a melee character, but this thing awards skill points when you turn it in. So you don't want to skip this quest. And it's also easy to miss. There's a lot of stuff that's easy to miss. And this area I've optimized just like Medea's Grove. So I'm doing my best to orate all my movements. But if you want, you might have to double check by watching the video instead of just listening. If you want to really learn how to optimize it, you're going to have to do it yourself a few times as well. So here's those Hanar dudes. I think they're worth killing, especially if you have max poison res. If you don't have max poison res, and I mean max poison res, then I wouldn't bother with them. But I think the Tortured Soul, especially on Legendary and Epic Mode, is definitely an item worth farming. It might even be worth it to find a good uh, Resurrection Shrine and Shrine farm them for a while. So this is the Dread Path. It's probably called the Dread Path because it leads to the most dreaded and hateful place in all of Act 4. It's the Tower of Lag. It's, it's no longer the Tower of Lag. I mean, they've really done a good job ever since Anniversary with fixing a lot of the lag issues. So if you remember this game for lag issues, it's gotten a lot better in that regard before. There are still some of those moments where you're like, I'm getting performance issues in a single player game. This kind of sucks. But, I mean, it's leagues and bounds better than it was. So now this is the dreaded tower of too many Grandmaster Archers. Which is just as bad as the Tower of Lag, frankly. But it's no worry, we're going to skip about 80% of it. You can read that note. I mean, I didn't provide you enough time to read it. If you like puns, then, you know, I don't want to be associated with you. No, but really, if you like puns, there's a couple of those notes around. They That's added them in Anniversary Edition, and they're extremely... I mean, they are puns. They're like dad puns. So, eat your heart out. Collect them all if you want them. There's four or five. So it's hard to talk while I'm fighting these Cyclops, but uh, right when you found the portal to the Tower of Judgment, you want to go back to the City of Lost Souls and turn in all those quests. There's a short follow-up to kill these two Cyclops. Uh, Cyclops are five times more dangerous when they're in pairs. That's because it's very hard to line up their shouts. So if Cyclops 1 is shouting, and then after a while Sh Cyclops 2 starts shouting, becomes very difficult because it's almost like you're permanently slowed. So you need to line them up in such a way that they try to shout you together or you bait one of them away and the other one leashes back, something like that. You have three.
So this is the quest that I skipped, that guy I just circled. Um, once you turn in the, I think his first quest is the caravan, the destroyed caravan quest. His second quest has to do with talking to this demon that you met over by the, the frost stone guardian. Uh, the reason I don't do it is because I think it's a waste. I think that it's a lot of running back and forth, and I, I frankly don't think it's worth the experience or the reward to do it. It's the one and only quest where I have that opinion. Most of the other annoying quests, I've come around to doing them. I've warmed up to it, especially with Ragnarok, where they made the quest rewards a little bit better. But you can see here I'm spending a small fraction of my wealth on on potions. We want hundreds of potions for the Tower of Judgment, not because I intend to clear it, but just in case I get hung up. We're going to be chugging potions every time well, they're off well, cooldown pretty much. Mortal. I swear I haven't sold a thing to those demons. This guy's actually pretty funny, his commentary. You have to talk to him a few times before he says some funny things, but uh, okay. But I like him. He's probably my favorite NPC. Back to business, selling to shades. So here we go, Tower of Judgment. Again, I think the Hanar are worth killing. I have max poison res, so I'm not too worried about their damage. That's one of the very few creatures I enjoy killing enough to get a little bit of experience here and there. And they have a decent drop rate on those tortured souls. Altogether, these guys don't make a reappearance anywhere else. They're actually pretty rare. So if you want to farm them, it's almost always going to be a shrine farm with intent. But here's where it gets bad. So third domain, this is skip domain. Just run through it. Now, I hate this domain so much that, I mean, I can break away from this game for two years, pick it up again, and I'll know exactly how to get through it. So I'm not even going to look at my map. I'm just going to run. I know where to go. And I suggest that you learn the route here and skip it yourself. It's just not worth the time and effort to kill Grandmaster Archers ever. You're kind of forced to in Hades Palace. But otherwise, I just kind of let them leash. Second domain is more of the same, um, with the exception of one thing. There's a quest monster here, one of the stone guardians. So there's four, there's four stones in total. There's a frost stone, a fire stone, a poison stone, and a magic stone, I think it's called. The first one we already have, the second one we get here, the poison stone. The third stone is, I forget the name of it, but it's probably my favorite area in this whole act. It's before Hades Palace, and the fourth one is in Hades Palace. But you can see if you're looking at my mini-map, the mini-boss is here. She doesn't always spawn in this location. I've, I've seen her spawn to the south a little bit more towards the entrance to this domain. But the last few times she spawned here. Now these Melanos are actually pretty tough, especially the Blade Dancers. Again, anything with Onslaught is just the worst. So you're going to want to bait them out and kill them before engaging the Poison Lady. Her poison hits extremely hard. As you can see, I'm just being devastated. Uh, it's potentially hard hitting. It's hard hitting on the next axe, even with max poison res. So again, all these areas are not procedurally generated. They're always the same layout. So that means you'll be able to know exactly where to go and how to get there. It's kind of a unique thing because even Diablo 2 had, uh, I don't know if you'd call it procedural generation. It's more like they had different snapping sort of map layers and sort of a random seed that snapped them together in some random puzzle. 
but you don't have to do any sort of memorization with the direction of stairs and stuff like that. You just simply follow the predetermined path. It's always the same path. So here's the first domain. This is my favorite place to farm for experience. You can see killing a pack of those, not too bad. These guys have no chance of killing you. They're not like the Lemos from Act 1, and you can freely gather them, a bunch of them, and kill them all. Of course, you get demon's blood, and I mean, by now you should have enough demon's blood for this whole act. You should not be farming here for demon's blood. It's a little late for that. But, you know, maybe you'll find demon's blood with better rolls. You can roll extra vitality resist. You can roll stun resist and health regen. Those are my two favorite. As a completion bonus, that's what I'm talking about. If you're someone who has trouble killing undead, and there are a few builds out there, a lot of people seem to want to play bleed and poison builds. Don't recommend it personally. There's too many enemies that absorb, not just resist, but absorb massive amounts of those damage types. And if you're playing one of those characters, you might have to skip those Lemos as well. And of course, you'll be skipping these guys. Now, I couldn't run past these guys, because unfortunately, they're guarding another quest, which is our friend Admetus again. So this was actually my worst nightmare. Um, one of these guys is a very hard... Actually, they're both heroes. And they're extremely hard-hitting. I mean, I have zero chance at killing these guys. I'm just... I'm trying my best not to die, so I baited them out, and I decided to it's make safe. a run for it. And Admetus, and Admetus had the gall to say, hey, it's safe here. No, it's not, dude. Not like he cares, he's already dead. Anyway, I did my best to get the treasure there. Yeah, yeah, I'm a coward. I'm not going to fight those guys. You fight those guys. So once you've done those two quests, you're ready to fight Cerberus. Now, Cerberus, he's like Barmanu. Everyone dies on him. He creates a lot of, you know, talk. How do you kill Cerberus? Blah, blah, blah. Max poison res. He does lots and lots of poison damage. He also does percent health damage, which is uh, resisted by vitality. So you can equip some of that. And having a piece of gear of the Glade, they usually come on bracers. They might exclusively come on bracers, I'm not sure. I think I've seen them on chest pieces. So if you have max poison res and something of the Glade, you'll be able to trade with them. If you don't have a piece of Glade gear, and I recommend looking for a piece of Glade gear and always keeping it, and only replacing it when you find a better one. Uh, but if you don't have that, you might have a Boar Hunter Shield. If you don't have a Boar Hunter Shield, then I recommend getting, um, what's it called? Hydrodon Hides. They drop surprisingly off of Hydrodons, those two headed fire breathing. I don't even know what they are. But you see them in Medea's Grove and other places in this act. Thank you for. It gives that same effect. The percent less damage from beasts so there's kind of a trick to this area as a spider attends to her weave so do i weave delicate symmetries in all i have to sell yeah uh, so there's kind of a trick to this area admetus appears for a final time and in order to get that quest out of your log you need to talk to him this final time i don't know why this is but when you leave this town and you, you get the next resurrection ready. shrine that's when he appears, or the portal here. I don't know why. You see, all of a sudden he appeared down there. I don't know why they coded it that way. It's a bit confusing. You wouldn't think to look back. It's a place you just left. But make sure you do that. Now, I used to skip this area, too. Again, I've warmed up to completing the quests here now. I think the most efficient way to do it, one is an escort quest, the other is to kill these siege striders, is to kill the siege striders first. Now these guys can easily kill you even with max fire res, but only one of their attacks is dangerous, and it's the one that looks like little chunky boulder things. The ones that look like pure fire, you can just eat those. 
They're not dangerous. But the problem with the boulder looking ones is they can all land at you at once. Sometimes it happens that way. I mean, it's supposed to be an AoE around him. But several times when I've played this game, every single projectile has come straight for my head. And that will kill you just like Typhon will kill you. So when you see the top mechanism start to move around a little bit, that's when you start wanting to run around like a headless chicken. At least until you know where those projectiles are going. It's this one that gives me the most trouble. I don't know why. I think it's just the geography. There are five of these guys in total. And once you clear them, that's sufficient enough to go back and start the escort. The escort's not too bad, by the way. You just have to clear forward just like that. It's uh, a little bit more palatable to clear forward just because there are a quest involved with it. If it were a, simply a case of an annoying escort quest where your escortee dies a lot, I probably would skip it even now. But there's that slight extra incentive to kill those siege walkers and complete a quest there, so I'm okay with it. The escort's not done there, though. This is dire. You want to talk to this guy, and I failed to talk to him three times, but I go back. You want to talk to him three I times, until this guy in the north by the tent gives you some men. And now it's all about just running. Uh, it's really hard to keep these guys alive. I don't think you need to keep them alive. It might be the case that at least one of them has to stay alive by the time you turn in this escort. But the good thing is they keep teleporting to you if you get too far away from them. That means you can just run and run and run. You don't want to fight any of those annoying enemies anyway. And that leads to the final part of this quest, which is just defend the flag. On higher difficulties, this can kill you, mostly because your ghost friends die instantly. Or pretty close to it. And then you're left to mop up these really hard-hitting enemies on your own. But don't be a coward, do it. This is the hard part. It's four blade dancers. You can stutter step and not take damage from them, or as much damage anyway. That's a good way to deal with Melanos or anyone with Onslaught is just a stutter step. Don't forget to kill these Formicids. They're a lot of fun. You can grind there. There's a cave, I think, with some formicids in them nearby. This is my favorite place in the whole zone. There's such a cool animation here. Once you get to the dark area, right there. It's like some bombs are exploding in the distance and it flashes red. I've actually never seen that animation. And I mean, this game, this act was made a long time ago. It's really, to me, one of the most impressive ARPG animations for ambiance in, a, in an area. I mean, it's so cool. It just gives you the impression like you're in this huge battlefield, which is exactly what they're trying to give the impression of. So many other ARPGs kind of do it wrong. There's just enemies standing around. It breaks the illusion. And in this case, there's enemies just standing around too. But that little flash, just that little thing, really pulls me into this area. I love it. Don't forget, and we're going to the back of this area, not just because we love it, but because there's a stone guardian. It's stone guardian number three. We're pretty close to the end of the act. The fourth one is in Hades Palace. So after we get it, we're done here, actually. That's the only thing you need to do in this zone. But there's one more quest before Hades Palace. And we'll see it. Um, we're actually going to run through this entire area coming up. You can see the Resurrection Shrine to the east, the southeast. That's the direction you want to head in. You want to follow these torches. You'll know you're on the right track if you see these self-exploding sort of mech striders. And here in the Highlands, I just run. I don't bother fighting these guys. They can spawn with Grandmaster Archers. They can spawn with a high density of Archers. Sometimes I'll turn around and kill them if there's a lot of melee guys following me. But they'll leash eventually. 
And you really don't want to stop running until you see all of these ghosts fighting all of these Melano. That should trigger something in your brain that says there's a quest nearby. Not because you had any sort of magical forethought, but because there's actually a quest nearby. And I find that clearing to the south is better than taking the quest, because when you accept that quest, he gives you like four dudes and they automatically charge down here and you're supposed to join the fight. Well, they aggro everything, and there's like eight blade dancers and they instantly die. They're more trouble than they're worth. So I decide that I carefully pull down here, kill the quest monster myself, and then just turn in the quest. I think it's the safest way to do this. So there you go, quest monster dead. Quest turned in. And now you're really close to the entrance to Hades Palace. You're gonna meet Odysseus and I think Agamemnon. And they're gonna blow up the open the mouth of the fortress. Well met here. With it is a secret. So you immediately run into an old friend once you enter this palace. It's Typhon, but it's dead Typhon. He's not nearly as scary as his live form. But he has a, a higher proportion of pierce damage than is typical at this point in the game, and that projectile ability can hit you with multiple projectiles, although usually not all of them. Also, some of his abilities, including, most importantly, that breath attack, deal percent health damage. So you want to mitigate that with vitality resist. So any physical, piercing, vitality resist, especially piercing, though, and physical, that you can muster for this fight will get you through it. It's a bit hard to dodge his abilities, especially at the speed I'm playing on. But as you can see, nowhere is near as difficult as his Act 3 form. And I don't believe this character has a lot of pierce resistance. Have mercy on Persephone. She's been chained there, staring at undead Typhon for who knows how long. At least an hour and a half. I think we've killed Typhon an hour and a half ago. Now I'm going to stock up one more time on potions and things. What will you? Trust me, you're going to need a bunch of potions for Hades Palace. You pretty much have to full clear it. That's what I've decided for myself. It's too dicey to kind of run through portions of it and only stop at the quests. The leash ranges just... May your flame they're not helpful nice. enough. So it's, it's very easy to get swarmed and overrun. That NPC is extremely annoying. It's easy to get overrun. When you're overrun, you don't want to walk backwards into an area you thought was safe just to find that you didn't clear it. There's more Grandmaster Archers or whatever. I mean, you need a safe area to run, and the safe area is always behind where you came in. So full clearing here is just something I kind of adopted doing. I don't want to do it, but it's definitely the safest way to get by. Make haste. So there's two things you're looking for in Hades Palace before you fight Hades. Actually, three things. One of them is the final Guardian Stone. It's pretty much the very last thing you do before fighting Hades. It's impossible to miss her. She's not in any side areas. Hades generals, however, they are in side areas, and so are the Crystals of Erebus. 
Now the crystals of Erebus, there are these five crystals. You'll see them in a bit. But they each drop a charm, and all five of them make up a charm itself. And that charm can roll a completion bonus that is potentially extremely powerful. I mean, some of the completion bonuses for this charm are plus one skills, uh, something like 80 combined resists on normal mode. I mean, I think it's something like 160 combined resists on legendary. And other ridiculously overpowered stuff. But you can only get one per difficulty. That's the caveat. So it's definitely worth completing that quest. It's something you can only put on a helmet. But it can potentially be the thing you put on your helmet. So you want to do the quest. The Hades General Quest gives you just a flat 5% damage. I think they added that in Anniversary Edition. I don't know how that damage is applied. I'm assuming it's multiplicative. In a sense that it just takes your total damage and at the end multiplies it by 1.05. And it stacks with the other damage increases you get in Epic and Legendary. So it's another quest you want to do. You have to do everything here. But it's not until you pass that first Stargate that you need to worry about any of these side quests. So you'll see as you're passing down the stairs here, there's one of the Shards of Erebus. And there's going to be many times in this dungeon where you reach a crossroads. There's like two ways to go. If it feels like you're going deeper in which is usually in a downwards direction, it probably means the other way led to a side quest. So in this case, we haven't yet reached one of them. I got really lucky again and found another Grandmaster Archer hero, but you can see his, his AI is really working against him. He shot me like three times, all while I was just standing there shooting him. I think it has to do with their dead zone, like if you close in on them, they try to break away. If you're shooting projectiles at them, that might trigger some logic for them to sidestep. I'm not sure. All I know is you want to be engaging them before they're engaging you. And sometimes it works out like that. They just kind of logic themselves to death. So in this case, the way downstairs is the way to the side boss. It leads through a Stargate that's guarded by Gigantes. They're always guarded by Gigantes, these Erebus Crystals. And it's the first Erebus Crystal. I think it's the one, actually, that we saw while going down those stairs. A quick note on these Gigantes. Sometimes you can get a Dactyl spawn. Now, Dactyls are a special hero version. They have a purple name. I think I actually encounter one at the end of this dungeon. They're absurdly overpowered. They should absolutely scare the crap out of you. They're very, very difficult to fight, and they'll kill you quicker than pretty much anything. And they absolutely are not worth fighting. The problem is it's hard not to fight them in some cases. And as you'll see at the end of this dungeon, I kind of have to fight mine. Even trying to run through them, trying to run past them is kind of dangerous. So here's the second shard of Erebus. It's in the middle of this H-shaped room. I tend to run through the center of this room. Picking up the shard along the way, it's right in the middle of the room. And now we're in the Winding Descent. So by the time you've reached the Winding Descent, you won't have killed any generals, but you should have two shards of Erebus. The first general is actually in this side room right here. The side rooms generally lead to the side quests. Now, in my opinion, the generals rank in terms of annoyingness and difficulty to fight in the same way you encounter them. So this first general is actually the easiest and simplest to fight. I think the last general is by far the hardest, mostly because of his room. But this, this general has a nice, wide-open room. There's no weird door transitions or stargate transitions like the second general. So you have a lot of room to dodge his projectiles, to lure his minions, and to dodge that ability. Now, I didn't dodge that ability the first time, but now I know it's on cooldown. That means I can anticipate it like I just did there. 
and I'm free to just wail on him. When I feel like it's off cooldown again, I start running around again and bait it out again. And that's all you have to do. I mean, the difference between whether you can bait that ability or not is a life and death issue on this fight. So just get used to baiting out the first one and use that internal sort of timer in your head to anticipate the cadence. And you'll be just fine. You can grind these Gigantes for monster infrequence, but pff, I really recommend you don't. Again, I don't recommend grinding for anything in Act 4. Anything Act 4 can do, Act 5 can do better. And it used to be that anything Act 4 could do, Act 1 of the next difficulty could do better. So this act has never really had its day, to be honest. Some people like farming it just because of its difficulty. Or maybe in spite of its difficulty, just who knows. If you ever watch those videos, there's a lot of uh, videos of people clearing this place. It's kind of one of the trials, right? If you have a character you think is ultimate, there's two real trials. One is Hades Palace, the other is the Secret Passage. I mean, there's some X max shenanigans where you fight, like, I don't know, three Hades or three Typhons or something like that. Or three Hydras. <laughs> So these albino spiders they actually drop a pretty unique charm. It's, it's very, very rare. It's probably one of the hardest charms to grind in the game. It's called albino spider web. And what's cool about it is it does a ridiculous amount of damage, actually. It's retaliate damage. It's electro burn. Or is it electro burn? I get the one in Grim Dawn mixed up with the one here in Titan Quest. Could be electrocute. Not sure. Anyway, it's electricity's degen component but it's very high retaliate damage. And so I considered maybe doing a melee profit using albino spider web and some other things. It'd be a pretty squishy character, so it'd need inheritance. But I never really got around to creating one. There's a couple charms though that really inspire me to make certain characters and build around those charms completely. And that's definitely one of them. So this guy's pretty annoying. One, you have to bait out that Eruption. That's not too hard to do. Eruption's not overly deadly. You can simply just get away from it. But it's hard to do that if you also get hit by the slowing projectile. And there's a lot of things that can come together in this fight to just get you killed instantly. I mean, you can see he's doing a ton of damage by himself, a lot more than the first general did. And his abilities are, frankly, more annoying and harder to dodge, so... I definitely put this guy in the middle in terms of his annoyingness and difficulty to fight. Don't try, I learned this the hard way, but don't try to lure enemies by going through the Stargate, hoping that this boss will leash. Uh, I tried doing that once and they shot through it, where I couldn't see them, I couldn't see the projectiles either. And then I got erupted on, so uh, that was definitely a death. So don't play with the Stargate. Do all of your fighting in that room. Once you fight him, you want to go back down into this main chamber, and you actually want to go north, uh, west from here. Hopefully I do that. I remember in one recent run, I got confused, turned around. Ah, no, I, I bamboozled myself here. So actually, you want to... If you've gone to the Dominus Poli, then you've missed one of the generals. You want to have completed the general quest before you continue down there. Is that right? Let's, let's just wait and see what happens. I think I explore around here because I got confused, just like I'm confused now. Yeah, I think this is it, actually. No? Well, that's embarrassing. Yeah, that's definitely not it. <laughs> right, so follow the very first thing I said. So once you kill the second general, the one with the fire, go back to the main area where the prison cells are, then head to the northwest. That'll lead you to the... 
Dominus Poli, I think you pronounce it. And the third general is actually the first left once you get in here. Now again, he's the most dangerous because, well, of a number of things. Mostly, in my opinion, it's because of his room. Very, very difficult approach angle. Your user interface blocks it. Has very tight corridors, and projectiles favor tight corridors. You can see I missed it. I don't know if I was thinking maybe I was going to kite up to this area or, or what, but I'm definitely not going to kite that far. We'll go back. But anyway, he's the poison one, the poison general. And he uses a paralyzed spell. That's a pretty deadly combination because he lays a pool of acid and it's extremely high damage acid, even with max poison res. If he gets the paralyze off on you, I would say you're pretty much dead. He might not die. But it's one of those things, like, if, if this game had a hardcore mode and I got hit by that Paralyze, I would, I would think myself pretty lucky if I didn't die. So what you want to do, I found, is to not try to dodge that poison. Just pretend like the poison doesn't even exist, frankly, and do everything in your power to dodge the Paralyze. Of course you want to sidestep the poison if you can, but not if it puts you in any danger of getting hit by the Paralyze. I'll happily eat any of that consistent degen damage if it means I can safely sidestep a poison. And sometimes it's like that. Sometimes the, mo the best way to get out of the poison is to move towards him, but that puts you in a, you know, a smaller distance for that projectile to travel. It's more likely you'll get hit by it then. So I'm just saying there's certain situations where it might not always be the best thing to dodge the poison just because it puts you in more danger of getting hit by the Paralyze. And you want to do everything you can to not get hit by the Paralyze. Anyway, he's dead now. That quest is resolved. This Warden of Souls is not a Dactyl. He shouldn't give you too much trouble. I actually got a regen shrine, which is nice. That key just kind of opens the prisons behind you. Honestly, really not sure what it's involved with other than that. Can't remember if it's involved with the secret passage or not. I stopped picking it up a long time ago. So forgive my lack of research on that one. If you want to know more about it, just Google it. This is the last shard of Erebus you need to know to find. The other two are actually right before Hades. Can't miss them. So the last thing we got to do before Hades is to kill this Empusa General. She's the last... Uh, stone Guardian. And she's also the most annoying Impusa Guardian out there. She uses that Mana Drain spell that the first General did. So what you want to do is you want to lure her adds away. She has a short aggro radius. And then just to run around like a chicken until she casts it once. It's actually on a very long cooldown for her. You can see how crazy it is. I mean, it drained me instantly. My potion filled me back up and it drained me some more, so that's a really, really difficult spell to deal with. So there's two spawns of Gigantes in this hallway. I wish the Dactyl spawned in the first one. He did spawn, but he spawned in the second one. You can tell it's a Dactyl because they have the defense DA aura, that white looking thing. If he was in the first pack, you can lure him up to the door. Dactyls don't like doors. Alright, Triple D. So what you could do is you can lure him up to the door and he'll just sit there, which is exactly what I tried to do here, but unfortunately his leash was a little too short. But if you can get past the doorway, he'll just kind of sit <laughs> on the other side of the door and not do anything. He'll just stand there and you can kill him with projectiles. So this is actually the worst case, is having a Dactyl spawn in the second Gigantes spawn location. And you can see I have zero qualms about cheesing him. I mean, you saw the damage he did with that uh, shockwave thing. If he follows that up with a hit, I'm dead. Just straight up. So, I mean, I can either cheese him or I can die. I think the, uh, I think the answer is clear. So I was eager to check what my completion bonus would be for these 
Shards of Erebus. Completed all the quests, by the way. We're ready to fight Hades. I don't know if I do it right away. I might actually do some extra prep. So what did I get? I got 10% total damage. Now, anytime I read total, I don't know if it's because of PoE, but I, I think of that damage as multiplicative, so total damage times 1.1. So that's pretty good, but I'm in Titan Quest not concerned about damage scaling very much. Not until, like, Legendary. I'm a huge proponent of... Attack speed, flat damage, and procs for attack-based builds. You can leave scaling to magic builds or whatever. Usually magic builds rely on multiple projectiles, though, like Turnian attack, eruption, ice shards, knife throw. Those all are carried completely by the shotgun mechanic. So you can argue that scaling there isn't even important. So I haven't talked about Hades at all. Basically, you want vitality resist. In phase one, he'll do this thing where he cups his hand and he throws something at you. If you get hit by that, you're dead, even with max vitality res. The reason for that is that little ball is supposed to break apart into a bunch of other little balls when it hits the ground. But I think what happens is if you get hit with it directly, the initial ball hits you, then each projectile that's supposed to split hits you as well, and it happens instantly. And that deals like... 4,000 damage on normal mode, so you can extrapolate you that to epic and legendary. It, it's, it kills you. It kills you like five times. So the very last thing we do in Act 4, this is your victory lap. You turn in all four of those stones at this ornate door. If you're having trouble finding it, just go to the City of Lost Souls and go backwards from there, go down the stairs. You'll see the ornate door leading to a cave. It's at the end of the cave. You, you have to put the four stones on four pillars. You can see all the nice shiny loot I got. Lots of blue items. It feels good. It feels good to get through Act 4 without dying. It's a nice reward. I think the game knew. It was like, nice going, man. It gave me three blue items. And the build's really coming together, too. You can see I started converting my physical damage to elemental on my weapon. Pretty good. All things are looking good for Act 5. Stick around for Act 5. I have a feeling that most people are interested in everything that uh, has been learned about Act 5 so far. And what ways Act 5 can work for you. I have a feeling I've found some pretty good farm spots. I have a feeling I know where a lot of the good items are for various builds. So stick around for next episode, and I'll see you there.